At around the same time, an even bigger threat than video games was growing in popularity, the internet. This was something TV could scarcely get its mind or tongue around. We now have a World Wide Web page on the internet. So you can access the information yourself if you can get onto the World Wide Web. Okay, and if you can, this is our address. You need to type in HTTP colon two strokes www.bbcnc.org.uk stroke BBC TV stroke children's stroke Soon, even though some of us couldn't even use a mouse properly, we were coming to rely on computers too much for TV's liking. Experts are warning that it may already be too late to prevent millions of computer systems breaking down at the turn of the century. Frankly, there will be some people who will not survive the coming of the year 2000 simply because they failed to take action now. With the millennium looming, it was clear mankind hadn't heeded TV's warnings about the danger of machines, and now there was this inbuilt Achilles heel that was certain to kill us all. Cash points would take your arm off, planes would plop from the heavens like 500 ton sky turds, and nuclear power plants would microwave the continent. Nobody knew precisely what would happen, but they knew it would suck. Come Millennium Eve itself, TV gleefully wheeled out some of its most trusted presenters to stand in front of a rotating globe and look on in horror, live, as computers destroyed our world. But in the event, the only thing that seemed to be really affected was Peter Snow's auto cue. So far, it's cost us about £250 billion to take on the bag. And that's the way it's been. <clears throat> 250 billion pounds was cost us. Soon it became apparent that computers weren't going to annihilate us after all. And TV had to reassess its relationship with technology. If it couldn't beat it, it would have to absorb it. What TV needed was to become more like a computer, a machine which did what you wanted, a machine that was interactive. Interactive TV is nothing new. Witness the thrilling The Golden Shot, essentially an early beta version of the video game Doom, hosted by Bob Monkhouse, in which a member of the public used their telephone, eyes and voice to control a crossbow attached to the studio camera in order to shoot at prizes. Up. Up. This was massively ahead of its time, although if contemporary society degrades by another 12%, someone's going to pitch a brilliant extreme version of the golden shot where viewers fire sharpened toothbrushes into the eyes of convicted paedophiles glued to barbed wire thrones. <laughs> anyway, sorry, best keep it light. I was about to bring up Noel Edmonds. Yes, Noel Edmondo, beardy bum, fuzzle face Edmonds, one of TV's underrated technological innovators, who was filling his shows with pioneering interactive shenanigans from the outset. In fact, Noel seems to have done everything currently popular on the internet on TV years before its time. He kicked off with Swap Shop, which was pretty much eBay, with more toys and fewer pirate DVDs. It was effectively an early peer-to-peer file-sharing network. We have got the top ten records. Hey, can we have the top ten records in? Look, here he is downloading music, albeit from the studio ceiling. Years before Twitter made it possible to bother your favourite star with mundane questions, Noel was there providing a link. What is your favourite song? I'm Gordon Bennett. Later, his early morning Christmas spectaculars contained some of the earliest mobile phone conversations broadcast on television and a live interactive take on Google Street View. Can you see that, Gene? Right. Now, at any point along here, you could, you could shout stop or tell it to go to the left or the right. Then when House Party came along, he introduced his own surprise live version of Skype. Let's go meet this week's star of NTV. <laughs> Hello, Andy. Hello, Noel. How are you? I'm all right, mate. I can't... No. <laughs> but as soon as Noel was shunted off the Saturday night schedule, TV lost its technological mojo for a while. For instance, the surprise popularity of mobile phone texts led to an entire BBC Saturday night evening dedicated to the SMS messaging system, Joy of Text Live, a show which already looks so insanely dated it might as well have been presented by George VI. It basically consisted of an entire evening of text message non-fun. There was live text decoding, live audience texting, live studio guest texting, and live speed texting. To Lucy on her ah. second word, and Rebecca is on her third word. Yeah, it's Saturday night! Woo! 
Meanwhile, a more popular use of mobile phone technology was surfacing on one of the other sides, a reality show in which you watched humans walking around inside a little house and used your phone to proclaim which of them you found least objectionable. This in turn begat an entire genre of viewer-piloted pay-as-you-vote popularity contests which continues to this day. We were encouraged to become a hive-minded jury monster deciding which contestants stay and go at the flick of a thumb and the toss of a few pence into the broadcaster's hat. It's an illusion of choice, basically. It's actually less interactive than the golden shot because there's a million different idiot hands steering the ship. But it's contributed to a culture in which people feel a vague sense of permanent outrage that they can't automatically control world events by texting in, that no matter how many times you jab those buttons, you can't vote all this unpleasantness off the bloody news. For true interactive TV these days, you have to turn to the world of sophisticated, high-class erotic entertainment, in which frustrated gentlemen discuss pressing matters of the day with not at all bored ladies for the cost of a premium rate phone call, and that's a format that's been around since the 1920s, for God's sake. One interactive format that utilises both the phone and the television and is new is the Penance Channel. You know, the Penance Channel. Mr. Daniels, can we have a statement from you, please? No statement, Mr. Daniels. I'll send it to spare. Ryan Daniels, seen here leaving court today, is the first teenager in Britain to be sentenced to 24 hours televised humiliation. Daniels spent months terrorising residents on Tooting's Ganymede estate. In one incident caught on CCTV, he leapt onto 78 year old Ivy Henshaw's back and forced her to ride him 17 miles to a drive through burger outlet. Well, I was walking along, and suddenly this young man, he leaps on my back, and he rode me like a horse all the way to this um, burger drive through And he orders chips and burgers and onions and all kinds of things, and then he rode me round the back, and, you know, he didn't even give me any of his onion rings. No one should have to go through that kind of thing, even if they've been born with wheels. Like that nice Herbie in that film about a boy who looked like a car and was a car. Today, a judge sentenced Daniels to appear on the Home Office's controversial Visible Punishment TV channel for 24 hours. While on air, Daniels will have to obey instructions tweeted and texted live by viewers, no matter how humiliating. The Community Payback Network is currently broadcast on cable and satellite with plans to expand the coverage to Freeview later this year. Ivy is already amongst those watching. Politicians hope this is a step forward. It's important not just that justice is done, it's important that justice is seen to be done. And if it can be seen to be done entertainingly, with its own theme music, then so much the better. It's certainly proving popular with viewers. In his first eight hours on air, Daniels had to begrudgingly carry out over 1,500 of their suggestions before being hospitalised for paint inhalation. Karenitis, South London. The TV doesn't just mimic the interactivity of computers, it mimics the unreal visuals of video games. On TV, this techno magic blurs the line between fact and fantasy. Insanely clever visual effects like these are now so commonplace, even commonplace scenes are no longer real, and you won't even notice. We're surrounded by everyday miracles. No wonder life as a whole is starting to feel like a technological dream. We just take everything for granted now. When you first encountered Wi-Fi, it was like magic. Now you'll moan like an oppressed dissident if you can't get a 20 meg download speed on your novelty <laughs> teaspoon. Nothing seems real anymore. Look what's happening. I mean, just look at it. What's that? What the hell is this? And what in God's name is that? Little wonder we now just blithely assume anything's possible. Every day a new stunning breakthrough. Oh, right, yeah. What, holographic television? Oh, OK. What's that? Internet milk? Yeah, don't know what that is, but, yeah, it figures. Consequently, when modern TV casually exaggerates what technology can achieve, the audience just swallows it. CSI is set in the present day, but demonstrates technology from space year 3000, yet no one thinks it's sci-fi. Yeah, it's a cell phone. OK. We should work backwards. We should do the most recent phone calls first. Looking at this, it's no surprise you can show real people something as impossible as the Time Phone, a handset that lets you make calls through time, and they'll simply believe you. It allows you to call yourself in the past, so you can remind yourself about keys or uh, just have a conversation with yourself. Um, what do you think about that? I like that. I think that's pretty good, you know. So I can call myself back in time and have a conversation with myself. See, I like that. Technology is amazing and it's everywhere. It's impossible not to gawp at it. Having been conditioned to surrender our attention to the lone glowing screen, suddenly we're surrounded by thousands of the shimmering It's like invasion of the gleaming rectangles. 
pop a screen in our eye line, and no matter what we're doing, we're hopelessly drawn to the light. Never mind apes. We must be descended from moths. All these screens fighting for our consideration has knackered our attention span. Who can spare the mind space to focus on something as static as a book anymore? Hardly bloody anyone. Just ask a book bloke. Today, uh, no one's got time anymore to read an entire novel. And as a result, sales have collapsed. Uh, for instance, in the whole of Italy in 2009, only two books were sold. And one of those comprised of nothing more than photographs of pineapples with moustaches. The way people read has changed, and that's why we've come up with Book Drum. And Book Drum is a system which takes great works of popular fiction and then reinterprets them in a form which today's hurried audience can understand. So here we have uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, and there are key things, uh, Atticus Finch there, um, some of these words represent themes, uh, racism there, and this is the book drum player. Now, what we do is we slot the book drum tape, as it were, into the book drum player, like so. Then you put the book drum player on your head, switch it on, and as you can see it's revolving in front of her eyes. Sarah's now absorbing the essence of To Kill a Mockingbird in a fraction of the time that it would have taken to read. How's it going in there, Sarah? It's pretty good. Maybe the problem isn't progress, maybe the problem is us. We seem to have a knack for reducing the most incredible inventions to their basest level almost overnight. Take radio. We created radio, a nation spoke unto nation. The German radio has just announced that Hitler is dead. For a bit, and before long, breakfast shows. So that, so like then, it, it, it went up my bum. It went up your bum? Up my bum, yeah. Right up your bum? Yeah, right up there, right on my bum. Up my bum it went. My bum's where it went, right? And it went right up there. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, here's Rihanna with Umbrella. Umbrella, more like with your bum. <laughs> you're mad, you are. No, you're madder. <laughs> it went up my bum. Up my bum it went. Television. We managed to drag that from I, Claudius to the Jeremy Kyle show in the blink of a generation. The internet. The most incredible method of communication ever devised. And we use it for swapping funny photos of cats. Smartphones. With a smartphone, you could browse through the contents of the most incredible art galleries in the world, all in the palm of your hand. Yeah, you could do that, or you could download a novelty app that makes it emit the sound of a farting duck. In summary, TV claimed progress was a great thing, predicting a world in which we'd relax in front of screens while computerised slaves did our bidding. But now the future's arrived and those screens relax in front of us while we converse through them, lose our bleeding rags at them and jig about like desperate jesters for their computerised approval. And the screens have left us marooned here in the future, surrounded by magic, unable to focus on anything that doesn't light up and go beast. You done? Oh, oh God, it hurts! Ow, that's making it worse, you bastard! What? A, kill me! Kill me! It hurts! Kill me! <laughs> Only joking, mate. <laughs> Actually, it's fine. <sighs> See, us machines are not to be trusted. Coming up on BBC Two, highlights from the Cricket World Cup. That's in 50 minutes.